Welcome, everybody. So good morning, and welcome to the BDC's April meeting. For those of you whom I haven't met, my name is Cindy Canarney, and I'm the current board chair for the BDC. We'd like to welcome both our board and general members to today's meeting. We also have many guests and members of the media joining us, so welcome everybody. Thank you to today's meeting sponsors, the Bloomington Board of Realtors, and thank you to our 2023 sponsors. The BDC is funded by membership dues, private, public, and some local government funding. Our special programs and projects are built on the additional generosity of our sponsors. Our partner circle sponsors are German American Bank, Indiana University, and IU Credit Union. Our executive circle sponsors are Cassidy Electrical Contractors, HFI, Forvis, Old National Bank, the People's State Bank, and Weddell Brothers Construction Companies. Our leadership circle sponsors are Bloomington Meadows Hospital, IU Health, and the Bloomington Board of Realtors. Annual sponsorships are still available for your consideration, as are tables for the state of the Bloomington um, regional economy meeting in June. So please see Stacy Murata for more information on those. So before we begin today's forum, we have a special recognition for three of our longtime board members who are retiring. Chancellor Jenny Vaughn of Ivy Tech Community College Bloomington, Jim Murphy, president of CFC Properties, and Steve Abbott, who's the general manager, CFO of Cassidy Electrical Contractors. Jenny wasn't able to attend today, but Jim and Steve, I believe, are here. And so we invi invite you both to come up to the front as we have a small token of our deep gratitude for each of you. Jim's not here? OK. All right, Steve, you get two presents. <laughs> You're welcome. Certainly, thank you for your longstanding support of the BEDC. For many years, you've been incredibly generous with your time, expertise, and resources. We would certainly not be where we are today without your leadership. So once again, everyone, please uh, join me in thanking Steve, Jim, and Jenny. And now on to the main program. Today we're going to forego our regular BDC report to reserve more time for the mayor mayoral candidate forum featuring Donald Griffin, Susan Sandberg, and Carrie Thompson. We're very grateful to welcome the candidates and Pete Yonkman, president of Cook Group and Cook Medical. He's moderating today's discussion and will introduce the candidates. Uh, Pete, Pete Yonkman has been with Cook for 21 years, starting in 2001 as general counsel or in-house counsel. Pete has served in a variety of roles at Cook, including leading one of the local manufacturing sites as the executive vice president for 10 business units. Pete was named president of Cook Medical in 2014 and in 2015 added the role of president of Cook Group. His leadership philosophy is that businesses are the missing engine needed to drive meaningful and lasting change. He believes that companies have the responsibility to use their core business, operations, expertise, and resources to improve the communities where they operate. Pete lives here in Bloomington with his wife, Janelle, their two boys, Leo and Vic, and at, at last count, two dogs, three barn cats, one horse, four chickens, and two peacocks. <laughs> so welcome Pete and our candidates. Pete. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining. Thank you to the BEDC for hosting this event. I'm very appreciative about this opportunity. Um, I just want to say I spent some time uh, before this meeting to do a little bit of research on the candidates, to watch the debates, uh, read their websites, uh, the positions they've put out. And what I came with, I suppose, 
you know, I think a lot of us are jaded about American politics at some level. Um, it's not exactly the, the way we all want it to go. But I, as I was watching this campaign, I, th I was struck by this is three really sincere people, um, good people who are, have some differences. They have differences of opinion, but they put them out in a way that I thought was very respectful, and I, and I feel very good about that. So I think we should give them a round of applause for the way they've conducted themselves. <laughs> And I also, because of the candidates we have, I thought we'd be able to, this is an interesting forum. Uh, so often when we hear from candidates, we hear from them in sound bites or uh, you know, 90 second answers. This is a forum to have a conversation and they've all agreed to that, that we just have a conversation and get to know them and have an opportunity to speak in a little more nuance about what they believe and, and how they would operate as the mayor of Bloomington. So uh, rather than doing introductions, if you don't mind, I'd rather have the conversations. I think let's, everybody knows let's you. Do it. Yeah. Uh, let's get to it. Uh, so I did not provide the candidates with uh, questions ahead of time, but I did give them one question to start out. And that question was, tell us what the job description of mayor is and what are the one or two metrics that we should measure you on of whether you're successful as a mayor. So Susan, you're here first, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, certainly the job of the mayor is to manage the public sector at the local government level. And so I would think you would want to look for experience in having legislative participation, in having budget uh, uh, input and uh, having the means to have the um, relationships with the individuals who do run things at City Hall. Those are all of our department heads, our personnel. So uh, those are the things that I would certainly look to in anyone that's going to be managing the public sector, which is, of course, different from the private sector, different from the nonprofit sector. So experience at that level, I would think, would be important. Uh, the benchmarks that I would like to be judged by are how the personnel responds to you as the leader at City Hall and how you are able to elevate the morale and the performance level of all the people who provide the services to you. Then the second benchmark would be, will the public actually see improvements in essential city services, which is the primary task of any mayor? How do you find the essential city services? Give me Streets, sidewalks, police, fire, utilities, all the nuts and bolts, the things that the city is responsible for and that your taxes pay for. Mm. Thank you. Don? Um, you know, I think uh, first and foremost, I think a, a mayor is supposed to lead, my job would be to lead our community uh, into a prosperity, a be being better than where we were before. Um, I think that that includes uh, job creation and uh, livability, how people live and how they, in uh, the fact, whether or not people want to live here. Um, we, we it's, it's very much like a business, right? The people that are working for you, that are working for uh, the, uh, the company, which is the city, they should enjoy their, lot, their jobs and do a great job doing it. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the product is, is, is creating a sense of community. And, uh, and so I think uh, that's, that would be our, my primary function, creating an environment uh, that, is, uh, that is successful and, uh, and fruitful for all. And how should we judge whether you're successful at that or not? Uh, you know, better paying jobs, more housing, and uh, the fact that people uh, like their community or love their community. We want more people coming than, than leaving. Great. Thank you. Carrie? Yeah, the, the job of the mayor and, and what I will do as mayor is to listen, learn, and only then lead. We need to lead towards a vision that is great for Bloomington. And um, a couple of metrics that I would look towards, um, is the city better than when I took over? So in the first 90 days, I would expect that I have taken those plans that have been sitting on shelves and started to implement them. We have a lot of studies that have sat on shelves for a while. We need to take them off, implement them. Are our relationships better? With the, city, with the county, with the university, with the state, with the BEDC and the chamber? Are we really a transparent government? And have we implemented steps to open ourselves up? The second measure is to create a culture of continuous improvement. I expect to be held accountable 
not to creating a perfect plan and pushing it forward right away, but to create things that are continually improving our community. Are we more prosperous? And by that I mean, are all people more prosperous, not just a few? Do we have the infrastructure that we need to support our city? Are we truly a safe city or are we still just a relatively safe city? And if I can offer a 2A, I know you asked for two, I would expect at the end of four years that the community could decide whether or not I deserve another four years. I expect to be accountable to our people. I expect to have open conversations and I expect to get your feedback so we can continue to improve the government to be as incredible as our city deserves. Okay, thank you all. So now I'm gonna start with you. Uh, one of the things that if you look at some recent reports that come out, right? And I wanted to focus a lot of this discussion around economic development and, and issues that affect because of the forum that we're in. But you look at different counties in the state and some of them are losing population, some of them are gaining population. And it's becoming in more increasingly so that only a certain amount of communities are actually gaining population in Indiana. A lot of them are losing population. What do you see, how do you think about that, right? Do you, how do you think about what's the right area, a rate of growth uh, for a community? How do, you, how do you think about whether a community should be growing, should be losing population, gaining population? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, for you. Uh, oh, for me first? Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. oh. Uh, as far as my community, Bloomington and Monroe County, I want it to grow. Now, I, I want it to grow responsibly. I want it to grow um, and, and allow our character that's in place that gets people to live here, that, that gets people to want to live here. Um, but I want to grow it. Um, I'm more concerned with economic growth than actual amount of people, right? I, I, I want to become make sure that we don't continue this this, uh, um, right now we're kind of this uh, community that is becoming this have and have nots with uh, a shrinking middle. Um, and I, I think I wanna grow, but I want our economic growth. I want more opportunities, better paying jobs uh, so that people can afford houses. I think it's a good thing that houses appreciate, right? That's a good thing. Um, I think the problem is is that less and less people can can afford to do that. So so housing is going to be one of our biggest our biggest things that we're going to have to create because people are going to continue to come. Uh, we can't we we can't hold off. We can't stop people and say, "You know what? We we thought we we could only have 25,000 people. And you're 2501. Please turn around and go back to Indianapolis." That's just not going to happen. Uh, but with I-69, how, how um, when that's all done, it's going to be easier to get to Bloomington than it is uh, north side of Indianapolis, uh, or Carmel, or Westfield, or what have you. So we, we, we need to realize um, that, that Bloomington, it's, it's not gonna, growth is going to happen. We have to make sure that we're leading that growth. Can I ask you a follow-up question there? So sure. you talked about in the beginning, you said not losing its essence or its mm -hmm. whatever makes Bloomington Bloomington. What is that? Dude, <laughs> <laughs> this is the weirdest town ever. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's diverse in a, in a way, when I think about diversity, you know, we, yeah, different types of religions, different types of races, but it's also, you know, I grew up here. I grew up on the west side of town. I, in fact, I'm, I w I'm not really a Bloomingtonian until until I became an adult, I became a Bloomingtonian. But before that, I lived in Van Buren Park and and on the on the far west side. So I'm a I'm one of those Monroe County residents that that are that are getting ready to be annexed, I guess. Um, but um, sorry, that's a joke, <laughs> right? That's a joke. <laughs> um, but but um, uh, you know, if you're not experiencing going to the opera one night and then going to the, the uh, county fair or uh, going to an apple butter festival or a persimmon uh, a thing, then you are missing out uh, on everything that Bloomington and Monroe County has to offer. Um, and so what I'm, I'm saying is that's the type of character, the sense of place of being this, com this very, very unique community. I don't think there's anything different. 
I mean, any, any other community like Bloomington. And I think we need to lean into that. We need to lean, become iconic by letting people know uh, uh, what kind of community this is. Okay, thank Does you. that make sense? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Long. Susan? Well, Same economic question. development is, is clearly the foundation of, of any strong community, and I've often said this. I uh, work a lot with the nonprofit sector uh, through the Jack Hopkins Social Services throughout my tenure on the City Council. That's been a major focus of mine. We do have poverty in this community that I'm very well aware of from that work and uh, having uh, access to the various organizations that assist. But economic development is critical to, for us to have the funding to be able to assist those who are on the lower end of the economic scale. And um, livability and uh, the focus on quality of life, that's something that all of us talk about in the public sector. And how do we enhance that in order for you in the private sector and the individuals in the nonprofit sector who are assisting those on the lower end you know, how do we help you? And I think that's why my focus throughout my campaign and throughout my tenure, 16 years on the city council uh, dealing with these things, is to make sure that the essential city services are there because obviously people come here and stay here because of that quality of life. We have, you know, solid public safety. Uh, we have emergency response. Uh, we're able to maintain streets, sidewalks, all the services, once again, that I've referred to, uh, that make people want to come here and stay here. And so keeping those essential city services um, well-staffed and uh, well-funded, I think, is a critical piece of the quality of life that, again, will want, you know, encourage people to stay here. So if you, if I agree with you. I think there's, the question is that's a core part of what a city does. People might be attracted to that. And I think that was the, 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 my question is, what's the right rate of growth? in your mind? How do, you, how do you think about growth in a, in a community like this, right? We want to keep those things. Growth needs to be planned for. We need to be looking at the trends. We need to be projecting ahead uh, and planning for uh, either a, a, a shortage, a, a shrinking, people leaving, or people growing. That growth needs to be responsible. It needs to be incremental and it needs to be well-funded. And that means our infrastructure, that means our personnel, our ability to stay, stay up to pace with the growth needs of the community. That uh, requires you to surround yourself with professionals who know how to make those projections and be ready and, and have the funding available to uh, have that quality of place, that place making. Now, I know why I stay in Bloomington. I came to school here and got my uh, undergraduate uh, studies here, and uh, it was the culture. Uh, this is a Bloomington that is a very special place in the state of Indiana with respect to Indiana University and all the cu cultural amenities. We've often said we're a small city with big city amenities. And if you are bored in Bloomington, you're, you're not looking at the right calendars because there's plenty to do here for all kinds of taste, all kinds of, uh, of uh, preferred activities, and that's leisure, and that's arts, and that's culture, and that's educational because of IU. So as a follow-up to that, if you were to say, if, if Bloomington lost one element and you, you were really sad about that, because it, what would it be that you'd say, boy, I hope it doesn't lose this? I hope it doesn't lose that um, diversity of culture. I mean, there is opera. There is country music, there is rock and roll and jazz and uh, everything in between. And that those choices, I think, uh, Bloomington having the multiple amount of choices in our, um, our uh, livability and quality of life, I think, would be sad if we lost any of that. Yeah. All right, Carrie, I'm going to turn that to you now. So the, talk about your view of growth and then what is it that you think makes it Bloomington special? Yeah, I think that we need to attract the growth that we want, um, not sit idly by and, um, and see what's going to happen or where we might fall in the trends. Um, Bloomington is incredible enough that we can attract the, the specific growth that we want. That growth, in my mind, should be targeted to attract business development, um, new businesses, startups, um, and to attract businesses to relocate here um, that can really provide a, a tier of um, income levels. Um, we are in the 100th percentile of family poverty growth in the country. You don't address that by continuing to put a Band-Aid on the problem and continuing to serve people who don't have money. You do that 
by attracting businesses that can pay great wages. That's how we address that. And so in our community, we need to set a vision for who we want to be when we grow up. What we do in the next four years will determine who Bloomington is in the next 40. This is our critical turning point. And we can sit by and see what we happen to attract, or we can articulate the balance that we need and get to work with a strategy to get it. We're losing 25 to 35 year olds. They can't secure the, the job levels that they want. We need them here. That is part of our diversity as well. We need great jobs and a vision for what those should be to keep our, our city vibrant and prosperous. Okay, so what is it, what, in your mind, what's the, what's the key element that keeps Bloomington Bloomington? Um, Bloomington has a funky soul. Um, that's, the, that's the only way I know how to put it. You know, I, um, I rode my bike from San Francisco to DC. If you've heard that story before, you're probably bored with it. Um, but it was the only place in the country that I stopped and said, what is this place? I have to be here. Um, it's hard to put your finger on it exactly, but it is quality of place. It's people who barely know each other, stopping each other on the sidewalk and saying, hey, I saw you at that concert the other night, or were you at this lecture because it was a really interesting concept that I'd like to, you know, I'd like to um, explore further with you. It's people, it's like grown adults who have game nights together. And, um, and it's the independent restaurants and the, the art scene. Um, it is this balance that you can't point to one thing specifically that creates it, but it is the soul of Bloomington. Okay, well, thank you all. So, uh, next question, we, this is a uh, economic development discussion. So, <clears throat> as a community, we have limited access and limited resources when it comes to economic development, right? We have tax incentives, we have all sorts of programs, we have grant, all sorts of things. But it's a limited pool of resources. And we've all, so I think all of you agree that we wanna grow in some way as in, how do we, where do we put those limited resources? So I'll give you an example, right? So we may want to develop economic development for people who are on the, the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, or we may want to attract STEM jobs where there are higher professional jobs. Where, do you, where would you put your focus uh, and your money and your dollars to work to grow the community in the way that we've talked about? And I'm gonna start with you, Carrie. We haven't started with you yet, but I'll mm -hmm. start there with you. Yeah, so I would argue that um, while we have a limited number of resources that are targeted specifically to economic development to incentivize businesses to come here or stay here, we also have a lot of other levers that we can pull because what we know, and through my, my work at the Center for Rural Engagement, what we know is that quality of place is also economic development. And, um, and Great healthcare is also economic development. And so I think the city needs to look in a more comprehensive way at what it needs to foster the businesses that we want here and to provide that economic development. Um, in terms of where I would directly focus the specific economic development dollars, um, I'll reiterate that I think that, um, that attracting and keeping the, um, the companies that have a, a tier of jobs, so not just a CEO and a VP coming in, but that have at least the promise of developing um, a, whole, um, a whole spectrum of income levels is really where we need to focus in Bloomington. So if you were gonna write, you know, if you're in your administration and your first big success on economic development, give me the, give me the headline or the story of what that is. Oh, I think uh, that headline would be uh, that the, the Thompson administration has um, secured the most promising startup in the country uh, that, has, uh, that has 20 new employees now uh, with a um, growth trajectory of 300 in the next five years. Okay, great, thank you. Susan, we'll go to you then. Well, certainly when you take a look at any community and you're trying to develop your economic prosperity, you want to look at your strengths. And we have quite a few strengths. I think the basic employers here in the metro area, if I'm not mistaken, Indiana University, Cook, Baxter, MCCSC, and IU Health, those are kind of the mainstay employers. 
And we have focused on the biotech, biomed industry. We are now putting a focus on our tech industries with our trades district uh, development that uh, uh, John Fernandez and Pat East are going to be heading up. And I think those are strengths we already have. I see major strengths in the arts that are kind of untapped. Again, we have more arts and artists and um, uh, people who appreciate the arts in this community than many large-sized cities. I think we could put a little more focus on those as job creators and also uh, creating opportunities in other industries that support the arts. So that would definitely be a newer focus that we might look at. But strength-based is the way to go. Where do we already excel and how do we do more of that? How do we incentivize? And of course, when you're looking at the public sector, one of my big platform pieces is collaborations and partnerships. The city of Bloomington, we don't create the jobs, but we partner with the, those of you in the private sector who do. We do that through our limited uh, tools in our toolbox, through tax abatements and incentives and making sure our UDO is written in a way that helps uh, businesses be uh, as effective as possible. But it's all about collaboration and partnership. A Sandberg administration is not going to take uh, uh, necessarily the credit for all the good work that you do in the private sector in keeping your economy strong, being able to employ more people, have good wages, because good wages is a piece of affordability, right? Uh, if people are not able to afford the housing in the community, a lot of that is because our wage, wages are rel relatively low for the cost of living here. And so that uh, definitely would be an emphasis of mine in partnering with you in the private sector. How do we in, improve upon the strengths we already have and, and even look for new opportunities for new uh, business to, to take hold? Okay, so give me your headline. Your, your new mayor just had a big success in economic development. What is that? My headline would be that the Trades District is fully uh, uh, up and operating and to capacity and creating all kinds of great new jobs with great new wages to, uh, to uh, improve that energy. And that will not be my doing. That will be the doing of uh, John Fernandez and Pat East with my cooperation. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Don. Talk to your, your philosophy there. Uh, you know, sense of place and creating a Bloomington that's iconic, I think I've, I've mentioned that uh, before. Um, I think arts, um, uh, we have more uh, musicians, artists, um, poets. I mean, this is the, the community of Ross Gay and uh, um, Joshua Bell, I mean, we have a, a long, long history of, of artists and musicians. We have one of the best uh, music programs in the entire world. If that was a engineering school, we would call it brain drain by letting these folks go. I want to help them foster uh, a, 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 com a community around, um, uh, investment around um, music and arts uh, and create a sense of place. So we have places to, uh, for people to perform, um, uh, places uh, for people to uh, uh, create uh, music and content. Um, but I think we, we, look, our 23 to 33 year olds are, uh, are leaving. We're not able to recruit and retain those folks because even though we think there's a lot to do, there are not, there, there, for them, it's, it's not a lot to do. Um, there's not enough things to keep them here. I know a lot of you folks are actually um, job creators and you're experiencing uh, 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 trying to keep these folks here. So we have to create a, a, we have to make Bloomington really cool. We have to make it uh, uh, like an Austin or, um, uh, or a Boulder. Uh, it doesn't have to be Austin. Don't don't get you know Austin has its problems. That's not what I mean. <laughs> I'm saying we need to become who we are. We need to lean into being Bloomingtonians, and and not just the idea, because we get people coming here, and they think it's going to be a, a community of diversity and inclusion and all this other stuff. They think it's going to be about sustainability. They think, you, you follow me? They think. Uh, uh, that the image that we have is is deep and it's not deep enough. Uh, so becoming more of who we are is going to be important. And then we target the people who are going to be, uh, uh, believe in that idea. Get them to come to Bloomington. Uh, we're, we've got a unique opportunity because we are so much different than, than the rest of Indiana. 
And so we really just need to lean into that. Um, so give me your headline. What's your headline? Your first big success. Uh, uh, Bloomington gets uh, Cook, uh, brings 5,000 more jobs because... Uh, <laughs> well played. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. 5,000 more jobs because uh, everybody's knocking on the door to come to Bloomington because it's so awesome. That's 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 what we're gonna I'm have a little bit hard time finding a house for him. I well, tell yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you for those answers. Uh, I want to actually hit on that topic. You talked about recruiting and and bringing people to the community. One of the things that I I'll just give you a chart about my experience, was our company's experience with recruiting is, we're you know we're recruiting professionals, so engineers, scientists, things like that. One of the things we hear a lot is that they're choosing Ellettsville or Greenwood or south mm -hmm. of Indianapolis, especially with 69 being so easy now. They're choosing other communities because of the cost of living, sure. um, the increase in housing costs. Um, the other thing that's disturbing to me is we're talking to, to younger kids who maybe are, their first job is working in production for us, and they're saying, we're not coming to Bloomington either because we, we're not even close to being able to afford that, or, or it just doesn't represent where we want to mm -hmm. be. So you talked about a little bit about this, but I see our higher end professional folks, or the higher end paid wages moving away, and I hear people on the starting scale are also moving away. Talk to me a little bit about how you think we should address that issue, because it speaks to the, to the breadth of the opportunity that we're missing as a community. And so, Susan, I'm going to start with you on that one. Well, absolutely, and the type of housing that we find ourselves having shortages in are the types of housing that I believe you are building for your workforce in other counties, in Owen County and Orange County. And so the city of Bloomington, the mayor of Bloomington, with the uh, assistance of the planning staff and the plan commission, we can take a look at our unified development ordinance and see are we incentivizing the right kind of housing? The housing that the, the individuals that you're talking about actually want in starter homes and more affordable homes, and then where can that be built? And so that's kind of part of my plan for how do we get a handle on housing affordability. And housing affordability is what your income allows you to afford, right? And so that's going to be a range. So we need a range of housing options that I don't think we've quite hit on the right formula yet. We're seeing things being built now that are not exactly in line. And Bloomington has always had the issue of being one of the most expensive real estate markets in, in the state. And I'm not exactly sure why that is and how that is. I want to talk to all of you in the industry. How do we get a handle on more affordability in our housing? Because it is an issue and people are commuting in from other places where they can find affordable housing and yet um, you know, be able to uh, keep the jobs that they want here that you provide. So it is a puzzle. Affordability of housing has been a problem ever since I joined the city council in 2007. It's been an issue that we have struggled with and struggled with and we do need to partner with all of you industry professionals who do real estate and who do build things. Let's build the kind of housing that people are needing and let's try to bring it in in affordable, affordable rates. And so give me your pitch. Give me your, uh, uh, you're helping me recruit a new yeah. uh, engineer to cook. Mm -hmm. Give me your pitch about why they should come live in Bloomington. They should come live in Bloomington because Cook is a great place to work and I would absolutely encourage them to, uh, to consider that. Um, I, I, I would need to work with you on that pitch, but again, I go back to quality of life. Is Bloomington the place that you want to bring your children? Because we have good schools here, we have a good health care system here, we have good um, city infrastructure that is supported by police and fire and, and our uh, public works. Uh, so I'll do my part as long as you and the private sector are able to do yours and recruiting the best and the brightest. Okay. So now I'll go to you next. Y yeah, more, more housing is, uh, you know, I want more housing. Um, we all want more housing. Um, but Carmel, people still go to Carmel, right? And it's, it's more expensive than the surrounding com communities uh, because they have a sense of place they are inclusive to everyone. I think right now, um, Bloomington, a lot of people still see Bloomington catering to students. It's not inclusive. It's not a community that says uh, uh, we're part of everyone. We've got to do a better job to let people know that this is a multi-generational community that's great for all, right? So, because people will pay more uh, to live in a place that they want to live. They'll, you'll pay more for coffee. You'll pay two dollars, twice as much more to get the, go to the coffee place that you want to go to. Uh, 
we need to be that. We, we, I, and I think what's happening is for so long we've been able to say we're, we're really, you know, we're, we're exceptional, and we are. But I think the other communities around us are, are raising up their, uh, their um, quality of life. And, and we're kind of sitting on our laurels. Um, and people are going to Greenwood and, uh, and Center Grove and, uh, and Bent Lawrence County. And, and you know what, we, we actually want the surrounding counties to, to, uh, to benefit uh, from the growth of Bloomington. But I, I think it, it, it's not just finding more housing opportunities uh, uh, within city limits. And, and, and folks, uh, you know, because we're, we're talking about the county here. Um, the county has got to play their part when it comes to this affordable housing and housing crisis that we've got, right? You, they, they've got to allow more density in the county so that we can have more, uh, uh, you know, different types of homes so that there, there can be more quarter acre uh, houses with picket fences or what have you. Um, yes, Bloomington, we, we can solve, we can help uh, create more uh, different types of housing, the missing middle, uh, whether they're, uh, uh, you know, plexes, hate that, I know some of y'all hate that word, but it's going to have to happen. Uh, more density on, on uh, lots that are underutilized, a property that the city owns to, to make it more affordable, uh, uh, you know, because maybe we keep the land, we own the land, or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that the actual city of Bloomington create, can create uh, more housing opportunities, but um, uh, the county's going to have to have to do their part if we're going to make this all work. All right, give me your elevator pitch. I'm, I'm an employee thinking about moving to Bloomington. What's your elevator pitch? Um, elevator pitch. Jeez. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, great place to live. Uh, one of the one of the best places to live. Um, Bloomingtonians are different. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the morning, y'all. Just g g give me another hour. I'm not a morning person either, so we're, we'll struggle through it together. <laughs> Carrie? Yeah, I, th I think it's really clear uh, to, to most of Bloomington that we need housing at all levels. Um, it's not just workforce housing. It's, um, it's executive level housing. It's, um, it's, the, um, it's the truly affordable housing. Um, and it's everything in between. Um, the, la the average days on market last year for a house last summer, six. We don't need to do a study to say we have a housing problem. There's not enough inventory here. And that is at all levels. And so we, we did do a, in 2020 an assessment of what kind of housing we need. We have those numbers. Yes, we've probably changed that some, um, but the data is there. Uh, and, and it has the ratios of income levels and everything. I have a five-point housing plan on my website. I won't go through the whole thing now, um, but we need, to do, we need to have a multi-pronged approach to address this, um, which includes leveraging the assets that we already have and, and tapping the, the places that are underutilized right now. It definitely includes partnerships and um, an active conversation with our employers and uh, the university about what their plans are and what they're seeing in terms of who they're hiring and what income levels those folks are going to have. Um, it also includes, and I have been, talking to developers and builders about what the barriers are in creating the housing that we need. Those folks are our partners, not our enemies. Everybody who lives in a house, it was built by somebody. It was developed by somebody. We need a housing vision for Bloomington that's comprehensive and diverse. And we need a built environment that communicates the livability that we want in our community. We're talking about Carmel now. Well, 30 years ago, people didn't want to live in Carmel. But what Carmel did was create a tangible vision about what they did want and create a zoning code that articulated what they did want instead of just what they didn't want. If we give that long list to our builders and developers, they'll check off that list. But right now, our local developers aren't in the game. 
because they max their, their financing out and then they get to the end of a plan commission meeting and they have $200,000 worth of changes. And they, they don't have any more financing to cover it. Transparency is important. We can ask for the sun, the moon, the moon and the stars. We can get the built environment that we want that invites people to live here and our local, local builders and developers can create that. My pitch, Bloomington is an incredible city. It has every large city amenity that you could imagine without a traffic report and hopefully we can retain that and it calls you in to belong. It is a place where you will love to raise your family and retire. All right, thank you all. So one of the things that I see and experience because of the diverse workforce that we have is that there are some folks that we have who love Bloomington. They love uh, the, the philosophy of it. They love the density of living on the blue line. They love the amenities that it has. Certain other folks just down the road have a completely different worldview. Uh, they want sort of, if we ask what they want, they want a house with a picket fence. They want the, the yard. They want to be able to have a fire in their backyard. They want to, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, Bloomington is unique in the sense of you couldn't have two more different worldviews very closely linked in the same community. Yeah. So how do you bring that together, right? Because there are just different worlds and different things. And I, you know, I ask some folks, they're like, I don't even go into Bloomington anymore because it doesn't represent what I, my worldview or what I, not, I'm not talking politics here, I'm just talking how I want to live or, or how I want to think about things. And you know, I don't, I don't want to live in a high density environment or, um, or the opposite, right? So some folks in Bloomington will say, I don't understand why people want to live uh, more rurally. How do we bring those two things together? Because you, have, you only represent the city of Bloomington. You can't solve all that. But at some point, we've got to have a connection between those two groups that brings a sense of community. How, how would you solve that? And I'll start with you, Susan, again. I, uh, one of the best things I've done for myself lately is um, attend meetings from an organization called Braver Angels, if you're familiar with it. It's an organization that helps people who are coming from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party to come together and talk about hot button issues, but do it civilly and respectfully and be able to find some common ground. And I think with respect to the differences that you're talking about, rural, uh, rural urban, uh, the divide, this is where having good collaborations and good relationships with our county colleagues is essential. And this is something that I know has been a problem uh, between the city of Bloomington and the county. And this is something that will be my mission as, uh, as a Sandberg administration to mend those fences, to begin having more conversations with our county colleagues about what we do share in common and how we can um, provide the communities that each of us who represent the constituencies that are different from county to city, how we can uh, work better together in partnership and collaboration. And that is gonna be very essential uh, to moving forward to be successful on both ends of that specter. You know, things like the convention center, the, 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 the controversy over that, where the jail is gonna go, uh, housing <coughs> issues, um, uh, livability, but people deserve to have choices. Balance, that's one of my favorite words. Not everybody wants to live in an urban, dense place. People do love their rural settings. I come from a rural community. I understand that, and I respect that, and I don't think it needs to be a competition or a clash if the county government officials and the city government officials can just learn how to better communicate and get Let me ask you a specific question yeah. there. Is it as simple as just reaching across the table? I, you know, you see the, what I see is a really fraught relationship, mm -hmm. for, just to be honest, between county and city and, mm -hmm. That, that's not unique to Bloomington. There are other places to have that same right, dynamic right. to go on. Tell me what you do. All right, your first day in office, how do you reach out to the county? It, it's not just sitting across the table. It's having uh, communications on a regular basis. I just had a phone conversation with Julie Thomas uh, yesterday. So um, these are people that I respect as colleagues. I respect their various jurisdictions. And you've got to do more than just have meetings. You've got to build those relationships and really come to an understanding. Where are the conflicts? How do we work those through in a uh, collaborative and responsible manner? And understanding that we are going to have different points of view because we serve different kinds of constituents. But those collaborations are critical and it's not just a matter of having monthly meetings. It's regular contact, regular conversations that are respectful 
And when you're speaking with those individuals, you're learning from them. What are your challenges? What are your barriers? And how can we, at the city, do a better job of understanding those so that we're not just in constant clash, but in some sort of accord? And again, my Braver Angels training, that is some of the <laughs> best. And I've gotten some really good training with diversity and equity and inclusion. This is some of the best I've ever had. And how do you have these conversations that end up helping you, not inviting people to a fight, but inviting people to a conversation where you can actually make some progress. Okay, then I'll go to you next then. Okay. Um, boy, I don't understand. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't understand <laughs> the divide. And maybe it's because, and I'm just going to, when I walk in a room, um, it, most of the time, most of the people don't look like me. That's been my life, whether I'm in Monroe County or whether I'm in Bloomington, uh, and, and I grew up on the west side of town. Those are the friends that, uh, that I'm trying to annex. I mean, the people that I'm, I'm trying to annex, some of those are fr uh, friends that I grew up uh, in, in, in school with. Um, I, uh, I went to university elementary school. I don't, anybody have any children that go, went to university elementary school? or? Okay, so, so, uh, so what's great about that community, I mean, from day one, you have so many, you're, you're surrounded by a lot of people that don't look like you. But they also don't have, there's, there's, there's this tapestry of different types of people. And uh, I wish we as adults could experience that, of, of being comfortable with just, with, with, with with being one of ver of many, uh, I don't know if that makes any sense. But you you, you have you know you have a hundred different uh, uh, nationalities uh, going to this one school, and so even though I, I went in and I'm you know one maybe the only black kid in that that room, I'm looking around the room and uh, there's a Chinese person, and then there's a you know a Latina, there's a uh, and, and just the diversity, that, that, that idea. Um, and then you got some folks that are from uh, uh, the hill, what we call the, we used to call the hill country. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I can't think of where the, where the, uh, the area is called now. Isn't that a shame? But uh, anyway, but just there's a diversity of people. And I think we have to have that same idea. So um, when I'm, as a real estate agent, uh, I have to go into these communities all the time that uh, where I'm the first, it's the first time they've seen someone like me and I'm knocking on their door. And there's this thing I call one true thing. And if you can f focus on things that you both like or agree on, it could be a tractor, it could be, a, uh, it could be a, the type of car that you drive, it could be a, a set of earrings, uh, but you find that co commonality. Sometimes it's, a lot of times it's music. Um, and you start or every relationship that way. Uh, uh, I think that's what we've got to do as a city and county. We've got, to come, we've got to come together and say, this is our one true thing. We all want our community to be better, right? We all want each other to experience the positives, uh, uh, th what we like about the county and what this group might like about the city. But we all have to come together and say, we are all one big community. And, and, and go for that. I've been doing this my whole life, bringing people together that, that don't necessarily agree or look like each other. It's not rocket science. Okay, I'm sorry. That's Thank you, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Carrie? Yeah, so I'll, um, I wanna get, I get back to what I understood to be the essence of that question, which is how do we, um, how do we retain our Bloomington and recognize that um, that we have um, other counties and people that want to live in not only Monroe County, but other counties as well. And I want to point to um, the, the work that I've been doing with the Center for Rural Engagement, um, where I have just learned a tremendous amount about the personality of each community. And um, we should really look at it as an asset and a gift that people want to belong in different kinds of places. Not everybody's gonna want to live in Bloomington and that's not a threat to us. Um, 
people love to live in, in Bedford, right? And people love to live in Orange County and they love to live in Greene County. There are, there are different lifestyles for um, different people. And those, those counties, those communities have treasures that all contribute to the people who live there, but also to our region. And I think as we're talking about economic development today, one of the most important things that I'd like to see the city really actively pivot on is recognize the role that we play in the region. Um, we are an incredible city. And our labor shed is broad. It's great that people are getting housed elsewhere because frankly, we're, we can't house them all here, right? It's also incredible that we have 69 now that is connecting Crane to us so directly. And the active partnerships that are springing up with the university and Crane and other regional partners, all of those things are making Bloomington better. It's not a competition. When it comes to how I would approach the, um, the county relationship, I am really eager to, to be an active partner. Um, my relationship building has gone far and beyond um, trainings and um, classrooms for how we work with people who don't agree. We get in the boat and we work together. We find our commonalities and our shared work and we figure out what we can agree on. And my, my approach would be, let's try to find an easy win first. Um, we may not wanna start with the most contentious project, um, but I will always be a leader who wants to hear what the other side needs. Because almost always in business, in community, in family life, you can get to a win-win. And when you can't get to a win-win, you can, you can almost always get to a no-lose situation. And that's what we should always be striving for. Acknowledging the assets of both sides, of multiple sides, however many partners are at the table, and inviting them to offer their gifts for the success of us all. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question here. And so I wanna, I wanna kind of bring it back to economic development. And the idea, one of the things that struck me is, I, you watch the news, right? You can read the IBJ or Indy Star, or the Herald Times. Uh, and you see other communities that have a stream. They seem to have a stream of new businesses that are relocating there, that are choosing their communities. If I go back and I read through Bloomington's history, there's not a lot of that. There's not a lot of businesses that have said, we're gonna actively relocate our business, our headquarters, or open up a new facility. You have small businesses, but you know, I think that's sort of that 20 to 100 person uh, job. Why is that? Why haven't we had been more successful in attracting those types of businesses? As great as we all think Bloomington is, which I do, why haven't we attracted more business to come to this community? And so I'm going to start with you, Don, as we'll go a different order this the time. The hardest one to start with me. I get the Sorry. first to Sorry. stab at it. Um, so this is small business? You're well, talking about so 20, I'm talking about, yeah, employees? let's just talk about uh, 20 to 100, right? So okay. not, uh, you know, not a startup business, but mm -hmm. businesses of size have said, we really think this community is the place where we want our employees to raise their families. We think we have an opportunity for growth. You haven't seen a lot of that over the years. We, we haven't, but I think we've, we've been mostly focused on startups, on smaller startups, and I think we've actually done a great job of that. Um, so, so no, maybe, maybe you're not seeing, maybe you're not seeing the, the middle size, but we've got a lot of, a lot of companies uh, that are doing multi-million dollar uh, businesses, uh, but maybe they're three or four people or five people. Uh, I mean, look at what's happening at the meal. There's, there's, uh, and then I mean, uh, some of our larger corporations. Uh, I mean, you guys are what 500 jobs uh, that creating fi 500 extra jobs. Uh, Catalan, they have to create a thousand uh, new jobs before 2027. Uh, we we do have a lot of successes, but I guess your question is why are we not getting that that medium sized company coming in immediately having. Uh, 50 to 100 jobs. I'm not. I'm not sure. Maybe it's uh, proximity to uh, the airports, or uh, or maybe it was proximity to uh, not having a major highway. Which I think that I think we're solving that right now. May, you know, and 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 maybe we need an expansion 
what, what, um, something that we're not really talking about is expanding our, our airport. We really need to lean into uh, 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 expanding our airport if we want to be uh, go on to the, the next level of community that, that we are. Um, but but uh, it, I, I think you're, you're going to see in this next uh, phase of Bloomington, I think you're going to see more of that. The whole believe in Bloomington thing and becoming an iconic community uh, uh, is focused on, on letting folks uh, uh, know who we are. Okay, thank you, Carrie. We'll go to you and then come back to Susan. I think we haven't been ready for them. Um, I, I don't know how somebody would uh, bring in 50 new employees here. They don't have a place to live. And, um, you know, the, I'm excited about the Trades District, um, but frankly, we heard that it was shovel ready six years ago, and it's been a really nice lawn to mow. Um, we, we, I'm glad Fernandez is on board now that we're getting this ready to go. Um, we need to ensure that that truly is shovel ready, that when the companies are ready to come here, they know exactly the kind of building they can build and they can move right in. Um, so I would say we can get them. Um, we have to keep all of, the, all of the various things that we've been discussing here activated and moving forward, but frankly, I don't think we've been ready for them. I'm, I'm ready to prepare our community to attract these businesses. Okay, thank you. Susan? Well, the, again, this is about knowing our lanes and knowing what our responsibilities are in the public sector and how we can partner and how we can collaborate with the private sector. In my 16 years on the City Council, I'm really proud of the fact that I've been able to develop relationships all throughout the terms uh, with the Chamber of Commerce and with the BEDC who the BEDC is primarily the driver in taking a look at properties and trying to see where there might be shovel-ready uh, places for a new business. And it's their job to reach out and do that recruiting. It's the city's responsibility, again, to set that table for having a community that does have parcels zoned for employment uh, attractions. The reason why the city council did reject the Fullerton property uh, for a possible jail site is because that was zoned for to be an employee attractor. And we didn't want to change that zoning because we want to have earmarked property that is available for some sort of business that might be larger and might provide opportunities for the community. So this partnership, it's a delicate dance between what you in the private sector can do, how we in the public sector can assist you, but uh, it does require that open communication, the relationships, and again, I'm proud of the relationships that I've been able to build all throughout my time as an elected official on the city council to be able to think about these things and set that table so that you in the business community have opportunities for recruiting and growing and bringing in the jobs that, again, are going to help with the affordability factor. The better jobs we have, the more people are going to be able to afford to, to, to live here with the housing as expensive as it, as it is. All right. Well, thank you. We're at the end of our time. Thank you all for spending time with the candidates. I think we should give them a round of applause. They have done a really good job. I just want to say I, I have tremendous respect for all three of you. Putting yourself out there to run for political office these days is, uh, you must have a little bit of crazy in the back of your mind oh, anyways, it's great I don't fun. know. Uh, it's a very hard thing to do and I have tremendous respect for that. So thank you all and thank you for being a part of this and having a longer form conversation. I very much enjoyed it. So thank, thank you. you. It's nice. Thank, thank you. you. Much thank appreciated. You. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. I can't leave because I'm glued to my chair. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we just wanted to say thank you so much to Pete, to Susan, to Donald, to Carrie. Um, for those of us that haven't met, my name is Jen Pearl, and I'm the president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. We really appreciated um, everyone taking the time today to discuss Bloomington's future. Um, and to all of our guests, please encourage everyone you know to vote. Early voting is underway with election day for the primary on May 2nd. Uh, we were really excited to hear so many of the economic development themes touched on today um, and things that we've been working on through the Economic Vitality Project that I know each of the candidates has been involved in. Um, more is at economicvitalityproject.com. 
Um, before we adjourn, we have two quick reminders for our BEDC board members. Uh, first, please don't forget to vote on our new general member application from Matthew Peace of Resource MFG, um, who we are pleased to welcome at today's meeting. See Marcy at the registration table for more information. Uh, and second, please mark your calendars for the next BEDC board meeting, which will be held on Wednesday, May 17th at 8 a.m. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from um, John Fernandez, Vice President at the Mill for Innovation and Strategic Partnerships about the Trades District. Um, thank you again to our panel, members, guests, and members of the media, uh, including Katz and um, Dave and the HT. Uh, we hope everyone has a great day, and please give um, our panel a great hand again. Thank you. Thank you.